All right, so I'm Peter Poulin. I'm the CEO of Green Revolution Cooling. I've been uh, the CEO there since December. Uh, um, I think it, it's consistent with the stage of the company. The company has been led by its founder and our current CTO, Christian Best, who's done a fabulous job developing the technology and maturing that product. Consistent with what I was saying earlier, it's kind of coming out party. Um, both Christian and the board felt like it was time to bring somebody in that's got a greater strength in sales, marketing, business development, and that's where my core skills are. And so um, we decided to make a change to the, to the CEO role, and so that's what I've been doing. Why liquid cooling is starting to happen now? Well, it's really addressing several problems or challenges that our customers are starting to face. So let's start with densities, right? So today, for example, AMD announced a new server processor. In the fall, Intel will be announcing their new Skylake server processor. NVIDIA keeps introducing new processors. All of these processors are more and more power intensive, which is creating really high densities. Um, we actually have customers calling us now asking us whether or not we'll be capable of supporting densities as high as 80 kilowatts per rack by the end of the year. Now the good news is liquid cooling is very effective at doing that. We've actually deployed customers with over 130 kilowatts per rack uh, installation. So dealing with the density of some of these high performance, high density applications is one of the things that liquid cooling, particularly immersion cooling, um, does uniquely. One of the other elements of it though is uh, the cost. Now we've all heard about the greening of the data center. You know, our experience has been greening the data center is important, but unless there's a real economic benefit to it, right, it becomes a footnote, um, you know, in the annual report. So what we're able to do by using immersion cooling is one of the key things you can do is you no longer need the fans mm -hmm. that are in those servers. Yep. By simply removing the fans, you're reducing the power consumption of your compute by 15 to 20 percent. Then the, the power required to support the immersion cooling technology is significantly less than that 20 percent. So your cooling overhead is almost free. So not only does that, you now have an option as a customer. I can take that savings in a reduced energy bill or we have some customers where they're running into power capacity challenges. They've reached the, you know, the end of their uh, power envelope in their data center. By now moving that power capacity from cooling, it now opens up more capacity for their compute and enables them to defer some capital costs longer term. So that's another big benefit. And speaking of capital cost, right, one of the big challenges folks have is they're starting to build more and more data centers is it's expensive to build data centers. Liquid cooling, immersion cooling does not require a lot of the infrastructure that a typical white space data center requires. You don't need any raised floor. You don't need cracks. You don't need chillers. You don't need plenum. You don't need airflow engineering, right? So as a, you know, what we tell our customers is, all you need to do is provide us a roof, a three-phase power, uh, and a water loop, and that's all you need. So you can materially reduce your cost of building a data center from what Uptime says the industry standard is about $11.5 uh, per watt. You can do that for around $4 a watt with immersion cooling. So significant capital savings, as well as because you don't have all that build out, you can do it much quicker. Yeah. So you know, if you're a CIO dealing with trying to reduce your budget, a lot of the over-provisioning that you might have done in the past so you could be responsive to the business units and their unpredictable needs. Yeah. Now you don't need as much of that over-provisioning buffer yeah. because you can deploy capacity a lot faster. You know, when we look at the other forms of liquid cooling, um, some of them are really more a, what I would call a hybrid liquid air cooling solution. So let's start with rear door heat exchangers. Mm -hmm. Rear door heat exchangers, uh, are easy to deploy because you just attach them to the back of your existing rack. Yep. But they have a capacity constraint. Typically that's in the 30 kilowatt range. Right? Uh, and you're bringing water overhead in the data center typically. Yep. Right? And so, and the operating temperatures 
that it can uh, run in are relatively small, so you're often going to need the chiller infrastructure as well. So as a result of that, you have a maybe a 30 kilowatt capacity and your PUE, there's limits to the PUE reduction you can get. You know, the next one we might see are the, what are called liquid to the chip, right? Yeah. Essentially attaching the puck. Now, that can get you the higher capacity. And we've seen stuff as high as maybe 60 kilowatts yeah. per rack with that. The challenge with that is it only cools the chip. So you still need to augment that with air, much like uh, rear door heat exchangers, which really are a combination of using liquid and air. Um, the same is true of direct liquid to the chip. So you're putting liquid onto the chip, but it can't cool the rest of the server. So you have to augment it with some other air conditioning model. So while it does get you to higher densities, you're still augmenting it with air, and so that's gonna limit the, the PUE reduction that you can get with that product. It also introduces a lot of complexity when you think about server refresh. You know, a typical data center is going to have a 15 year life. How many times are you going to refresh your servers? Probably at least four during that, maybe five, right? So now think about those individual pucks on every single one of those CPUs, on every single one of those servers, having to remove all of that and reinstall it before you put your servers back in. So a significant challenge there. Then you get to immersion cooling. And there's actually two types of immersion cooling. There's what's called two-phase two -phase liquid, like 3M's Novak, and then a single-phase liquid, which is the type of stuff we use, right? Both of them will get you very high densities. Uh, I mentioned before, we've deployed up to 130 kilowatts per rack. Theoretically, we can get up to 200, um, but we just haven't seen anything that dense. But a couple major differences. Um, the Novec fluid um, is expensive. Yeah. It's typically about $200 a gallon mm -hmm. versus the single phase um, dielectric mineral oil, mineral oil essentially we use, about $15 a gallon. The, min the mineral oil also doesn't evaporate. Yeah. We've got a customer in Houston that's got about a megawatt, 1.4 megawatts deployed. They've got the same oil they put in six years ago. Right. Right? So, because it doesn't evaporate, not only is that two-phase liquid expensive, you have to keep putting it back in. So there's an interesting study from Lawrence Berkeley Labs they did uh, assessing the commercial readiness of these two-phase uh, fluids. Um, you can get the study on our site or other places, but the conclusion was it's not ready. Uh, and there were three reasons. One, it is very expensive. Right? Uh, and number two is they found they, they experienced a lot of reliability problems with the servers that were deployed in it as a result of the fluid. That was their conclusion. And while they, they had nothing that was specifically conclu conclusive, they were concerned about the high rate of evaporation and an engineered fluid and what health risk that might pose to customers. So you know, we don't have any of, those, um, any of those challenges that some of these other liquid technologies have. Who was it that said simplicity is the ultimate sophistication? That's one of the beauties of the solution. It is incredibly simple. You basically turn a rack on its side, put it in a tank. You can still remove those servers for service, right? You run an oil, uh, the oil, hot oil, out to a heat exchanger that's exchanging the heat with a warm water loop out to an evaporative cooling tower. There's three moving parts in the whole thing. Very few points of failure, very easy to maintain, you know, and very low cost. Yeah, one of the interesting things for edge, and you know, a lot of people have different definitions of what an edge environment is, but if you think about edge at a rack level, typically the reason people are moving them to the edge is to get closer to their customers or their employees. There's some unique challenges associated with that in where do I put it? I have to put many of these edges out and what can I secure and build a typical white space data center yep. with raised floors, cracks, all that. Yep. With our solution, you can virtually put it anywhere there's a roof, right? So you don't have that, so you can deploy really quickly. And in addition to that, you can put it into some pretty harsh environments. Yes. Like, imagine a, a containerized data center yep. in a sandy part of the world yep. with a helicopter landing next to it. 
If you're in an air-cooled data center, imagine what those particulates are going to do from a reliability perspective. So there's a high degree of environmental resilience because the servers are essentially protected by the oil bath. Well, I think DCD brings the right audience to us. I think one of the challenges that Green Revolution Cooling has had is, you know, they've been in a mode of really maturing the product for the last few years, right? Yeah. And have done a number of employments to continue to validate the strength of it and optimize it. Yeah. Now, we're at a point where we've really got to kind of have a big coming out party. Yeah. And DCD brings an audience to us, yeah. right? That enables us to reach a lot of our target customers and raise their awareness and, and educate them in a way that enables them to raise the awareness to other people as well. So it quickly, you know, you get the network effects of expend, ex extending the message through the thought leaders that are coming to this uh, event.